Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We thank you for this day that you have made. May we be glad and rejoice in this day. Lord, we thank you for saving us from the wrath to come. Because you have not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. And though on this narrow road that you have us on, we may stumble, we may fall. You're always there to get us back up. And so we thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for the blood of Christ which cleanses us and washes us from all sin. And so whatever we've said, done, and thought that was not pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, we pray for that shed blood to continue to purify us and wash us whiter than snow because we rest in your finished work and by faith we trust that everything has been accomplished on our behalf which is our everlasting salvation because there's no one else that we can look to for our help except you the king of kings and the lord of lords and so here we are O lord before your glorious high throne because you've seated us in heavenly places and we are waiting to hear from you O lord we're waiting to hear a word from you so that we can be strengthened so that we can be encouraged so that even though our outward person may be perishing yet our inward person is being renewed day after day and so may we feast upon your word the manna that bread of life that gives us sustenance for Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. So fill us to the full, O Lord, and nourish our souls. Nourish our souls with you, O Lord, because you are life. For in you we move and have our being. And so we thank you, Lord, that you hear our cries. We thank you, Lord, that we are heard of you. We thank you, Lord, that we have a personal relationship with you, that we can go to you as our mediator the God-man, Jesus Christ, so that we can make our requests known unto you and you would hear our requests and answer them according to your will and may it be done for your praise and your glory. So, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, dwell in us richly. O oh, Lord, fill us to the full so that our cup would run over with the seven spirits of God so that we can manifest the fruit of the Spirit love joy peace patience goodness kindness gentleness faithfulness and self-control oh lord we need you to live in us for if we walk in the spirit we will live in the spirit and we will fulfill your desires and our desire is to be obedient to you so may we be obedient today and may we always conquer, for you have given us the victory. Darkness is under our feet. Open up our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your word. Open up our ears that we may not just be hearers of your word, but be doers as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk by faith and not by sight. We give you all the praise and we say hallelujah. In the matchless, self-sacrificing name of the name that is above all names. For there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved except that glorious name, Jesus the Messiah. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and may all the church say hallelujah and amen. Well, praise God, saints of God. I'm thankful that you have come back to another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is opened. Everything will change, and today is Shabbat. So let's do a song. You know the song. Let's go. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, hey, Shabbat Shalom, hey, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat, 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 Shalom, Shabbat, 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 Shalom, Shabbat, Shalom, hey, Shabbat, Shalom, hey, Shabbat, 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 Shalom. 
First order of business is the gospel. And so for anybody out there that God has led to this channel and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this call is for you. And that call is to come. Jesus Christ let, said, let whosoever will come that is thirsty. Let whosoever will come that is hungry. And so that invitation to you, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, is for you to be filled when you come to Jesus as a sinner in need of a Savior. You see, right now you're lost, dead in your sins and trespasses, but because he's called out to you to come and he's pulling at your soul saying, hey, I want to do a heart transplant. All you have to do is say yes. All you have to do is say yes. Submit to King Jesus and he will perform this open heart surgery where he will take that stony heart that you have filled with everything that is estranged from him, which is wickedness and hate and evil and sin. And in return, when you give him that stony heart, he'll replace it, hallelujah, with the heart of flesh and he'll seal it with the Holy Spirit. And that's what it means to be born again, born again by the Spirit of God. And the only way that comes is if you call upon his name, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, God says you shall be saved because you're placing your faith in the finished work of Christ. When Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago, outside the walls of Jerusalem, the Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace fell upon him, and the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. You see, when God was in Christ on that cross, he was not counting our sins against us, but he was reconciling the world unto himself. The Bible says that even while we were his enemies, okay, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And because Christ died for us, because Christ died for sinners, when you come to him as a sinner in need of a savior, when you look to him and what he did on that cross, when all of your sin was placed upon him and you trust that his precious blood has forever taken away your sin, past, present, and future, and you come to him in need, hallelujah, of that precious blood to be accounted to you for righteousness, to be cleansed, to be bathed, to be washed in that blood. When you come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I believe, Lord Jesus, forgive me a sinner. When you do that and you mean business, meaning that you're true, okay, because you can't deceive God. If you truly want him to be your savior, at that moment in time when you do it, when you cry out in faith saying you believe, I believe that you died for my sins, Lord. I believe that you were buried. I believe that you rose from the dead. That very moment, God will give you new life. God will make you into a new creation. Old things will pass away. Behold, all things will become new. And you'll start along the narrow road from that day forward, forever and ever and ever, where there's new life, where in his presence there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. But you have to come. And so the time is short and the days are evil. And so make the days count because we have to redeem the time because the time is ticking. So I pray that today will be the day of your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin this study, Proverbs 27, verse 1. Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. A stone is heavy, and the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The full soul loatheth in honeycomb. But to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. As a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So does the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. 
your own friend and your father's friend, forsake not. Neither go into your brother's house in the day of your calamity. For better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. My son, be wise and make my heart glad, that I may answer him that reproacheth me. A prudent person foresees the evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger, and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. He that blesseth his friends with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. A continual dropping in a very rainy day, and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hideth her hideth the wind, and the ointment of his right hand which bereath itself. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Whoso keeps the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof, so he that waits on his master shall be honored. As in water face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. As the refining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. Be thou diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to your herds, for riches are not forever, and does the crown endure to every generation? The hay appears, and the tender grass shows itself, and herds of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for your clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And you shall have goats milk enough for your food, for the food of your household, and for the maintenance of your maidens. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So I want to touch on Proverbs 27, verse 21. That's why we read Proverbs 27. Because the word of God is truth and he's going to sanctify us with this truth. And so I want to set this whole teaching up uh, with this verse because this is going to tie in to uh, the last couple of videos uh, that God has used me to share. If you haven't seen them, I pray that you will go back and see them. Uh, because we wanted to, in those last couple of videos, we wanted to look at how God tells us the end from the beginning. And so we went. Back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 15 and then 1 Samuel. And so we see uh, God always being true to his word because he can't lie. And there, like he shows us everywhere, we see the rapture and we see the whole end time story played out. And so to get the background, those two videos were done, the last two that I did, because I want to go to the end of the book today where we get the meat, where we get everything fleshed out the book of revelation hallelujah in the book of revelation we see god's game plan in clear detail hallelujah and so this verse right here is going to tie into everything that we've been talking about uh, because today we're going to talk about the four woes hallelujah we're going to talk about the four woes that we find in the book of revelation and so proverbs 27 verse 21 says this Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested by being praised. That's the New Living Translation. Another translation says this, uh, the uh, crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but people are tested by their praise. Okay, so uh, the finding pot, the refining pot is for silver, okay, and the furnace is for gold because when you put the silver in the finding pot, and you put the gold in the furnace and melts away the impurities so that what comes out is pure silver and pure gold. Likewise, uh, Solomon, uh, the greatest uh, man born of a man and a woman filled with wisdom, said that in the same manner that uh, the fire uh, reveals uh, the purity of silver and the purity of gold, so too does the praise that a man receives reveal who he really is, you see? And that's the point, hallelujah. Because as we saw in Genesis chapter 15, there's going to come uh, a smoking pot 
Hallelujah. There's going to come a, a burning oven on the cloudy and dark day when God walks through the pieces, those eight pieces. Okay, four on each side. Uh, a new covenant. Hallelujah. Okay, the new covenant in his blood. And that smoking pot, okay, that crucible, okay, that furnace is going to be for purification for those who are with him, okay, the burning torch, okay, those who have oil for their lamps, okay, on the day when all the light is gathered out of the world, on the day when the restrainer is removed inside the body of Christ, and that restrainer is the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God that fill the seven churches of God, the menorah. So on the day when God walks through the parts, okay, when he uh, passes through like lightning from east to west and he gets everybody that looks like him, okay, every man's praise is going to be tested. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Every man's praise is going to be tested. And so if you have faith, your praise is going to be from God. Hallelujah. Because uh, you're going to receive rewards, okay? That fire, that purifying fire in the crucible, that purifying fire in the furnace, okay? That purifying pot fire in uh, uh, that smoking pot, okay? That burning oven, that burning furnace that passes through the parts in Genesis chapter 15. When we have to go through that fire, hallelujah, when we have to go through that fire, OK, we're going to receive our rewards if our praise is from God when he tells us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. OK. And what's going to remain when we go through that fire? Well, if you have anything uh, worthwhile that was done in the spirit, you're going to receive silver and gold and precious stones. OK, because the fire is going to reveal it on that day. The day of our test, as we stand before the Bema seat, when we pass through the parts as King Jesus picks us up, when he comes like lightning from east to west. Hallelujah. And so our praise is going to be from God because we have faith. But if you don't have faith, okay, okay, your, your praise is going to be tested on that day. And your praise is going to be found out to be that praise that you desire from men and because you desire the praise of men there's going to be four woes that come upon you that we read about in the book of revelation and so let me just bring it all together as we go through john chapter 12 where we see this belief and unbelief is the title john chapter 12 verse 37 let's read although jesus had performed so many signs in their presence they still did not believe in him this was to fulfill the word of isaiah the prophet Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they were unable to believe. For again, Isaiah says, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so that they cannot see with their eyes and understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many of the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me alone, but in the one who sent me. And whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should remain in darkness. Okay. <laughs> this, is the whole, this is the whole shebang right here. Okay. When you come to Jesus because you have faith, you're not afraid to be put out in the synagogue. You're not afraid of what your friends say. OK, because you want the praise of God more than the praise of men. God has promised that we would not remain in darkness. See, the cloudy and dark day is a day of darkness. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness. God said we will not remain in darkness. OK, there has to be a pre-tribulation rapture is spoken everywhere in the scriptures. God promised that he has come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should remain in darkness. On the cloudy and dark day, it's a day of darkness. Genesis chapter 15, where we see it played out, the Bible says the sun went down and it was dark. 
Okay. The sun went down and it was dark. The prophet Amos talked about that day. And he said, when that day comes, the Bible says he will make the sun go down at noon and he will darken the earth in the clear day. Well, God promised that if you believe in him, okay, you will not remain in darkness, both spiritually and literally. So if you are alive and remain at the time of the rapture, when Jesus Christ comes like lightning from east to west to pick up everybody that believes in him, our praise will be from him. And that praise will be well done, you good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, because we have confessed him, we have believed in him. And so when that finding pot comes, Genesis chapter 15, that furnace, okay, that furnace, because remember when Jesus Christ appears in Revelation chapter one, when he appears, what is the description according to John? Well, his feet are like burnished brass, burnished bronze that have been burned in a furnace, okay? He is that smoking pot in Genesis chapter 15. He's the tenum, okay? And in that pot, he's going to purify, okay? He's going to purify those of us who belong to him because we have to pass through that fire, okay? Because our God is a consuming fire. And when that fire tests us, like fire tests the purity of silver and the purity of gold, everything that remains from that test, from the Bema seat, everything that remains will be given to us as rewards. And thus, we will always be with our Lord because we can't be in darkness. But for those who love the praise of men, okay, on that day, Bible says a person is tested by being praised. So on that day when they get found out, when the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, the Bible says there's going to be four woes upon those who have been left behind. And so let's get into this because we see these four woes beginning with the dragon being cast out. Hallelujah. We begin uh, the first woe when the dragon is cast out. We see this in Revelation chapter 12. Let's begin at verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and sixty days. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. Okay. The same time that this great dragon is cast out, he's trying to stand before the woman to devour the child as soon as it is born. Okay. Uh, verses 7 through 12 is the same thing that we read about in verses 1 through 5 of Revelation chapter 12. It's just more detail of that event when Michael stands up. Okay. When Michael stands up, uh, that's what we read about in Daniel chapter 12. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 talks about when Michael stands up. We also see him in Revelation chapter 10. But let me go to Revel uh, Daniel chapter 12 so you can see Michael stand up. Okay, because this is the day of the great war in heaven. Okay, and darkness has to be under our feet because God says in John chapter 12 that we just read that if we believe in him, okay, if we believe in him because he has come as a light into the world because we don't receive the praise of men our praise is from god if we believe in him because he is the light of the world no one who believes in jesus will remain in darkness okay so we have to be caught up out of here the dragon wants to stand before the woman to devour the man child as soon as it is born because he wants to keep us in darkness 
Okay, he wants to keep us down here during the time of Jacob's trouble, but it's impossible because that which belongs to God has to come. Shiloh. Okay, that which is his must come. Okay, there has to be uh, a man child brought to Shiloh. Okay, there has to be a man child brought to Shiloh. That which belongs to him has to come. And so that's why the man child is caught up unto God and to his throne. Hallelujah. Okay. The man child is caught up unto God and to his throne because like Hannah prayed in her Thanksgiving prayer in first Samuel, uh, the second chapter, she said, she who was barren. Okay. Has born seven. Hallelujah. Okay. Hannah was barren. And what happened when she prayed to God and God heard her cry, God made her conceive. And she conceived a man child and that man child was Samuel. And she said uh, before she, uh, Samuel was conceived, she made a vow that that man child would be dedicated to the Lord and be in his presence forever. And so when the conception and the birth happened, what happened? The man child was brought to Shiloh because the man child belonged to the Lord. That which belonged to God had to come to Shiloh. Hallelujah. We, the body of Christ, are the man-child that is caught up on the cloudy and dark day because God says we can't remain in darkness. And so at the time when the war happens, when Michael cast the dragon and all the good angels cast out all the bad angels on that glorious day, on that day, the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Hallelujah. And so here we see it in Revelation chapter 12 playing out. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you that dwell in them, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. Okay, this is the same thing that we read about in Revelation chapter 10, when Michael stands on the earth and on the sea. <laughs> we see Michael stand up in Revelation chapter 10, and he's standing on the earth and the sea. And so here we read in Revelation chapter 12, that there's an announcement when the dragon is cast out that there's a woe okay there's a woe that comes to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea because the devil has now come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he only has a short time god has promised us that we can't be in darkness god has promised us that we can't be under wrath okay for God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. When this event happens, our rejoicing in heaven, the first thing that is heard when this day comes in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 12, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation. The Bible tells us that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. When the devil is kicked out, a loud voice in heaven says, now is come salvation. Why? Because there's woe to those left behind on the earth and on the sea. Because there's great wrath coming from the devil.
because he only knows that he has a short time left. It's the fourth beast kingdom, okay, when the iron mixes with the clay, okay, but because iron and clay is not mixed together, they shall not stick together. It's that time, the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, when the devil will be filled with wrath because it's his last stand. And God says we're not going to be part of that because that's darkness. And so we have to be caught up out of here on that day. So let's just go to Revelation chapter 10 to see this event again and uh, put everything together. Verse 1 of Revelation chapter 10. Help us, Holy Spirit. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. This is Michael the archangel. This is the rapture because Jesus Christ descends with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Okay, there's only one archangel mentioned, and that archangel is Michael. We find the title archangel in connection with Michael in the book of Jude. Let me just show you this. You see, I, I want I want God to be true and every man a liar. I just want to I just want to speak what God says. Okay, I don't want my words uh, to trump anything that God has said. So we go to what God says, and God says this in verse nine of Jude. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So the only time where you see this term, the archangel mentioned, with a connection to a specific person is Michael. And in this connection of Michael being the archangel, it's in contention with the devil over a body. And in the Old Testament, that was the body of Moses. So, again, nothing changes. God doesn't change. Everything happens again. Okay? Same story, different characters. And so, at the end, when the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, there's going to be another contention over a body. Okay? That contention over a body is the body of Christ, the man-child. Okay? The dragon is contending over this child that is about to be born. Okay, he's standing before the woman to devour her child as soon as it is born. Just like he contended, okay, over the body of Moses with Michael the archangel long ago. Okay, it's the same story, but this time it's the man-child, okay, the seven churches, okay, the body of Christ. And the dragon wants to keep us down in darkness. He wants us to be under wrath, but God, hallelujah. Okay, Michael is going to stand up on that day. And when Michael stands up on that day, look what happens. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud. There goes the cloud. Okay, so that's where we're going to assemble. And a rainbow was upon his head. Okay, that's the throne of God. Okay, there's somebody higher than Michael. He's an archangel. Hallelujah. But the one seated above him, above his head, Okay, that rainbow around his head, that's the throne of God because the rainbow surrounds his throne. Okay, you know that from Revelation 4. That's the first thing that we see when we go through the open door. Okay, when we go through the open door, hallelujah, we see God sitting upon the throne and there's a rainbow around his throne in sight like an emerald. Okay, green, a green rainbow because green is the fourth color in the rainbow. Okay, four is the door. Okay, four is the door. That's why in this teaching, there's four woes. <laughs> okay, there's four woes that we read about in uh, the book of Revelation because the door to heaven is going to be open. And these four woes are going to be revealed upon all those who want the praise of men more than the praise of God. So the praise of men will be woe. And there's going to be four of them because there's a door open. Because when the temple doors to heaven are open, everything is going to change. Okay. Everything's going to change, okay? God is going to test everybody by fire. The first time he judged the world, he did it with water. But this time, he's going to test everybody with fire. Hallelujah. Okay? He's going to test everybody by fire. Hallelujah. Because everything will be purged by fire. <laughs> okay? And so what's your praise going to be on that day? When everything is tested by fire. Okay? When that smoking pot. Passes through the pots when it begins, when the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. Okay. Are you going to be purified like silver tried in the fire seven times? Okay. What type of purification are you going to go through? Okay. What type of purification by fire are you going to go through 
That's the question. Well, if you come to Jesus today, right here, right now, that purification at the Bema seat, that trial by fire will be to see if you receive rewards. Okay. And then, and the good news, if you're at that beam of seat judgment, okay, and if that fire burns up everything, everything burnt up, lickety split, <laughs> everything burnt up, lickety split, okay. But the good news, hallelujah, you shall be saved as if by fire. Glory, hallelujah, okay. Even if everything on that day, because your praise was of God, hallelujah, not of men. On the day when everything changes, on the day when the door opens, on the day when Michael stands up, on the day when Jesus Christ descends on a cloud, on the day when he comes like lightning from east to west, and you're ready because you got light, hallelujah, that's the only requirement. If all you got, hallelujah, and all you got is a jar of oil, and that's all you need, hallelujah, that's all you need, hallelujah. That's all you better have on the cloudy and dark day is a jar of oil. <laughs> but as you pass through the fire, hallelujah, when we go through the pots, that new and living way, into the land far away, okay, into the Father's house, when we pass through the pots, hallelujah, and we pass through the consuming fire, okay, because we see God in all of his glory. And our God is a consuming fire. And everything is burnt away. Lick it and split. And you ain't got nothing else. But a glorified body. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord. Than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Rather be a doorkeeper. <laughs> rather just, I'd rather be at the back. Hallelujah. Keeping the door. As long as I'm not outside them doors. Hallelujah. <laughs> as long as I'm not outside them doors. Hallelujah. I'd rather be a doorkeeper than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You see? So, what is your testing going to be of? That's the question. Is your testing going to be the praise of God? <laughs> or is your testing going to be the praise of men. There's a separation on this day. And so here we see Revelation chapter 10, Michael stand up. This is the day of the rapture. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud and the rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. Okay, same book that he has open in Daniel chapter 12. Okay. When Michael stands up, God says, at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Okay. Here goes the book open in his hand on the day when everything changes, on the day of separation. Okay. Verse two. And he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. What happens in Revelation chapter 12? Okay. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, when this woe comes for those left behind, therefore rejoice you heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he hath but a short time. There's a woe. Okay, there's a woe that comes to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Revelation chapter 10, Michael stands up, one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea. Okay. His right foot upon the sea, his left foot on the earth. Uh-oh. Verse 3, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. If you want to know what the seven thunders are, go to Psalm 29. Hallelujah. Psalm 29 shows us the seven thunders. Okay. Psalm 29 shows us the seven thunders. Count them out for yourself. I don't have time to teach that in this lesson, but go to Psalm 29 if you're not familiar with it and read about the seven thunders. That's what's going to happen on the cloudy and dark day. God is going to cause his glorious voice to be heard. Okay, and them seven thunders, well, if you're on the earth or on the sea, 
When them sound of the thunder speak, well, verse five, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. Okay, no more time. Cloudy and dark day came like a thief in the night. Okay, no more time. Okay, Michael has now stood up and the Bible says, when Michael stands up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. No more time. Okay, it's the day of separation. No more time. Who you with? <laughs> no more time. Day of separation. Okay. Half the waters go up, half the waters stay below. The day of separation. Okay. Those who love the praise of God go up. Those who love the praise of men stay behind. Okay. Day of separation. Those who have faith go up in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, born of a virgin, died a redemptive death for my sin, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. He's holy. Harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You have to have faith in him. If you do, you go up because you got a jar of oil. You got light and he can't keep us in darkness. It's his promise. But if you love the praise of men more than the praise of God, if you fear getting kicked out of the synagogue, <laughs> if you fear getting kicked out of the synagogue, because you don't want to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because you love the praise of men. Well, God says, you're in the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> okay. You are in the synagogue of Satan. Okay. House of the dragon. Okay, with Jews who are falsely so-called Jews. You see, because Paul tells us the same thing. OK, Paul tells us the same thing about these people who love the praise of men more than uh, the praise of God. We see this in Romans chapter two. OK, when he talks about who really is a Jew. OK, who really is a Jew? Uh, Romans chapter two, verse twenty five for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law. Your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? Here's the key. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Got to be born again. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Hallelujah. Okay, God don't change. Same story no matter where you look. God says he had to have a heart transplant. You could, you could wear your tzitzits, okay? You could wear your kippah. You could wear your talit, okay? You could keep the Shabbat, okay? Uh, but if you don't keep everything perfectly without ever breaking one law, God says you've sinned, okay? God says you've sinned. And now, because you've sinned, now you need a sacrifice because God don't change. So where's your sacrifice? <laughs> okay. Where's your sacrifice? That's the question. Where's your sacrifice at now? <laughs> okay, you got your zeet zeet. <laughs> okay, you're a Jew. You got your zeet zeet. Got your talit. <laughs> got your kippah. Okay. Got your mezuzah on every wall. Okay, you rock back and forth. Ooh, you the rocking man. Hallelujah. <laughs> Look at them prayers at the western wall. You the rocking man. You rock back and forth. Ooh, you rock. Okay. 
You the rocking man. Okay. Look at you. See, but what happens when the time that you sin? <laughs> because the moment that you sin, uh oh. The moment that you sin, uh oh. God don't change. And the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. <laughs> okay, so now you need a sacrifice. So where's your sacrifice? That's the question. Where's your sacrifice? The Bible says, for without the shedding of blood, there shall be no forgiveness. Levit Leviticus chapter 17 tells us that he's given us. Okay, look at this. Okay, you want to live by the law? Well, hey, you shall die by the law because the law don't change. Hallelujah. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar. To make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Okay, so where's your sacrifice? Because it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And God says he has given it to you upon the altar. Okay, so there's no temple. So how could you uh, have a sacrifice when there's no temple? Oh, that's right. The chief cornerstone that was rejected that was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem on that altar, that tree, that cross. His body was the sacrifice. His body is the sacrifice. He is the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. He is the sacrifice. He is the altar, okay, that we have to go to. We have to go to him outside the gate and suffer his reproach, okay? If you want to be counted in the number of the children of God. You have to go outside the camp. Okay. You have to go outside the walls. You have to go out to the one who was rejected and despised by men. Okay. You have to go to the one who was rejected. And when you go to the one who was rejected and because you have accepted him, now he calls you a child of his. Now he calls you his son. Now he calls you his daughter because it's by his blood that he provided on the altar that has made an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. You see, but you got to want the praise of God more than the praise of man. And you see, a lot of people, they want to be in that synagogue. <laughs> they want to be in that synagogue. Okay, they want to be in the synagogue of Satan with Jews who are so-called Jews, but are really a synagogue of Satan because they haven't been born again. They want the praise of men. They want people to see them and say, hey, look at you. You're a good person. And they want to receive all these accolades. They want to be experts. <laughs> they want to be experts. Okay. <laughs> they want to be experts in the synagogue of Satan. And you got a whole bunch of experts. Okay. Whether it's experts in religion, experts in science, experts in philosophy, experts in music, experts in entertainment. There's all type of experts. <laughs> All type of experts. Okay, we just went through the biggest fiasco, okay, in our in our brief time on this earth, uh, and we're still going through it somewhat with the COVID nineteen. And then here you got all these experts, okay, so called so called experts in the house of the dragon, the synagogue of Satan. Okay, you got Rabbi Google. You got Rabbi Google. You got Rabbi Google. Okay. Got Rabbi Google. COVID-19. What is it? Then you, know, you see all these different things about COVID-19 and how it started and how it originated and all these different rabbit trails that Rabbi Google leads you on. And then you got other experts who wanted to bring solutions to COVID-19. Then you got Bill Gates. Dr. Fauci. You got Bill Gates. Dr. Fauci, ooh, experts in the synagogue of Satan. I'm an expert. Bill Gates. I created Microsoft. Okay, personal computers for everyone. But yet I can't even stop viruses from all the personal computers that I help to bring forth in this world. But I'm an expert in medical science. I'm Mr. Bill Gates. And then I have my friend, Dr. Fauci. 
Same Dr. Fauci who was around during uh, the AIDS epidemic when it blew out out of proportion in the early 80s. That same Dr. Fauci said, hey, Dr. Fauci came on TV as the expert. This is what you do. Because, you know, I'm Dr. Fauci and I'm an expert. What you do? Okay, what you do in the synagogue of Satan. You wear your mask and you be quiet. That's it. That's all. I'm an expert. And here we go. You see? And so what happens? All these people who want the praise of men, they want to uh, line up. Okay? They want to line up behind all these experts. Oh, well, he must be an expert. He's Mr. Bill Gates. He got a lot of money. Oh, well, Dr. Fauci. Well, he's a doctor. He, he's a, he's an expert. So, whatever they say, I'm going to do. And so, here we are. <laughs> okay? That was just a test run to see if all those who will be left behind will uh, be ready for what they're going to roll out next. Okay? And as you can see, the test run, 100% success. Test run, 100% success. Shut down the whole world. 100% success. They say, yeah, we done dotted all our I's and we done crossed all our T's. Woo! Now you know they ripe and ready because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And so they're going to be down here in the darkness and we can really roll out our plans. You see? See, this is what's happening, my friends. This is what's happening right before our very eyes. So-called experts are deceiving the people because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And so on the day of separation, on the day when the fire tests everyone's praise, on the day when the fire tests everyone's praise, well, what's going to happen? Michael's going to stand up. Michael's going to stand up. Okay. On the day of separation, and on the day when Michael stands up, he's going to roar as when a lion roars. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go ye out to meet him. Okay? <laughs> and right before uh, he roars, the bridegroom comes. Go ye out to meet him. The Bible says that Jesus Christ descends from heaven with a shout. Dead in Christ rise first. He got a little book open in his hand. Michael does. And then Michael cries out for those of us who are alive and remain. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go ye out to meet him. He cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. Okay. The Bible says uh, when Jesus Christ descends with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Those of us who are alive and remain when the trumpet of God calls out. We are all caught up, assembled in the clouds to meet our Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Ooh, it's a day of separation. You see? It's a day of separation. Hallelujah. Okay. Until that which is his shall come. Shiloh. Shiloh has to come. Okay. Shiloh has to come. That man child has to come. Okay. That man child has to come. And that man child came to Shiloh, Samuel. Okay. We are uh, the body of Christ, the man child. That which was barren has now born seven. Okay. The seven churches. Okay. The younger, the younger son. Okay. We finally come home. And now that we finally come home on the day of separation, God's going to kill the fatted calf. Hallelujah. On that day, God's going to kill the fatted calf because there's going to be a sacrifice on this day. Okay. It's going to be a sacrifice on this day. And the Bible says, on the day of this sacrifice, <laughs> I wanted to show you this. Okay, I wanted to show you this. Hallelujah. This is just Bible study. And pray that you're encouraged by this Bible study. You see, we got to jump here, there, and everywhere. 
when you do Bible study, you got to get, you got to get the whole picture. Zephaniah chapter one, look at the title, the great day of the Lord. Okay. The great day of the Lord. But I want to talk about this sacrifice, but let's just begin with verse one. The word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. A day of separation. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. Okay, these people all love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So God's going to bring judgment on this day. And what happens? Verse 7, here's the key. Be silent. Okay. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God. Silence. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guest. <laughs> you going to kill the fatty calf. Okay. You see, I mean, it's just so amazing how everything is everything and God cannot lie. On this day, God has a sacrifice. Okay. And he's invited his guests. Okay. Now there's two type of guests. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's two type of guests for the Lord's sacrifice. Okay. Okay. There's two type of guests for the Lord's sacrifice. Okay. Uh, there's the guests that have the right attire on that are going to be rewarded because our praise comes from God. And then there's the guest that have on strange apparel. Okay. That's left behind in the field. Okay. Like the older son in the story of the prodigal son, older brother left behind in the field. Okay. Older brother left behind in the field. Okay. Clothed in strange apparel. Okay. He didn't have on the garments. He wasn't there. He said when he came to his senses and the father met him at the second coming, Okay. And he's still complaining and he says, Hey, you never killed me no fatted calf or made merry with my friends. <laughs> never gave me no fatted calf. Okay. God has a sacrifice on this day. And the question is, are you gonna have the fatted calf <laughs> for the wedding? Mm -hmm. Are you gonna be the sacrifice? Hallelujah. Okay, because God, he got a sacrifice. <laughs> Either you're going to have a fatted calf or you're going to be the sacrifice. Verse 8, and it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. In the same day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Okay. So this is the day of separation, my friends, mm. on the day of the Lord's sacrifice. Let's just go to Genesis chapter 15. Hallelujah. I just want to put everything together by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. He's leading me while he's talking through this earthen vessel. Okay. Because these pictures paint the whole story. Okay. This, this, these imageries that God has contained paints the whole picture. Okay. We got to go back to the Tanun. Okay. <sighs> where God made this covenant with Abram. This is what it all rests on. Okay, the Abrahamic covenant. Because in Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Who is the seed of Abraham? Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. If our praise is from him, we're going to be caught up out of here. Okay. But if you're ashamed of him, well, your praise is of men and you're going to be left behind. And so God shows us what's going to happen on the cloudy and dark day. Verse 17. And it came to pass. Genesis chapter 15. And it came to pass. Dundada. This is the day. And it came to pass. When the sun went down and it was dark. That behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Okay. See, God has a sacrifice. Okay. 
there's a smoking oven, okay, and a burning torch, okay. Jesus Christ represents the smoking oven in the midst of the golden candlesticks. That's the burning torch, just like he appears in Revelation chapter 1, okay. And when he appears in Revelation chapter 1 at the time of the rapture, when uh, John says, behold, he comes with clouds, when he appears, the Bible says, that his feet are like burnished brass, as if they burned in an oven. Okay? So God is represented by this smoking oven, and he's in the midst of a burning torch. That's the menorah. Okay? Everybody that has light and oil, a jar of oil in their vessel are going to be accounted as the burning torch because we're the menorah. You see, but this smoking oven... Okay, this smoking oven is where God has a sacrifice. Okay, God has a sacrifice with this smoking oven because how that oven going to be smoking if there ain't no coals under the oven? Mm. Ain't no coals under them ovens. So you think. <laughs> but the Bible says in the book of Revelation, them coals weigh 100 pounds each. Okay. Under that smoking oven, there's burning coals. Okay, under that smoking oven, there's burning coals. So where you gonna be? You gonna be under his feet because darkness is under his feet. <laughs> darkness is under his feet. Under his feet, hailstones and coals of fire. Under that smoking oven, hailstones and coals of fire. You see, guys, God has a sacrifice. He's bidden his guests. He got to kill the fatty calf. <laughs> he got to kill the fatty calf. So you know he got to make that oven hot. Okay. Now you know when God. When he get to cooking, mm, mm, mm. now you know when God get to cooking. <laughs> now you know when God get to cooking. When he killed a fatty calf, ooh, now you know that meat gonna be tender. Okay. Now you know that meat gonna be juicy. Okay. Now you know that meat gonna fall off the bone. Hallelujah. God has a sacrifice, he says. Hallelujah. God has a sacrifice, and God says he has invited his guest. Okay. So the day of separation is going to depend upon your relationship with him. Are you going to be the sacrifice? Are you going to be at the sacrifice? That's the question. You see? If you identify with him now, you have presented your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service because we are identified with him. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. We are not ashamed to say that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are not ashamed to say that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And because we are identified, with him as the burning torch. God says, hey, for you, kill the fatty calf. But if you're ashamed of him on that day, well, you're under the oven. <laughs> you're under the oven. You see what happens when you're under the oven, when you're on the earth and when you're on the sea, when Michael stands up, okay, at the time of the rapture, his feet are as pillars of fire. Revelation chapter 10. His feet are as pillars of fire. Okay, burning. Okay, uh, it's a it's a it's a trial by fire. Ooh, everything burning. Okay, his feet are as pillars of fire, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Okay, so we know when that happens. Revelation chapter twelve tells us that there's a woe. Okay, that's the first woe. That first woe is when the dragon gets kicked out. That first woe is when the dragon get kicked out, and he comes upon everybody that refused the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, okay? He comes upon everybody that's been left behind that refused to have Jesus Christ to reign over them, okay? And so now the first woe is the dragon himself. He, speaking about God, gives the people who are left behind what they desired, okay? They say, hey, we don't want you to reign over us, God, so okay, I'm going to give you what you want. Now here comes the dragon, you want to be in the house of the dragon, the synagogue of Satan? You want the dragon? Well, the dragon you will have. Okay? And the Bible says it's a woe. <laughs> That's the first woe. <laughs> There's four woes because remember, four is the door. <laughs> 
Okay. When everything changes, the door to heaven opens. So there's going to be four woes that come upon everybody that's left behind, the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. And the first woe is the dragon. There he go. There he go. There he go. Look at you, you dragon. Look at you, you dragon. Watchmen. What of the night? Watchmen. What of the night? Watchman, show me someone left behind in the day of wrath. Night, night, go, go to sleep. Told you, fear on every side. All hands feeble, all knees weak as water. Boldness upon every head, sackcloth upon all loins. And when it is day, you will cry to God, would to God that it were night. And when it is night, you will cry to God, would to God that it were day. Night, night, go, go sleep. Told you, dragon, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Okay. So there goes the first woe. <laughs> when the dragon comes down upon everybody left behind in the house of the dragon. And so now we get the other three woes. Okay. And so we're going to go to Revelation chapter 8 to see this play out. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 8, we see the other three woes. Okay. As we go through the scriptures. And it begins in Revelation chapter 8 with these other three woes. So let's begin at verse 1. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Okay, so don't miss that. See, and help me, Holy Spirit, and help all of those who love you understand this book. Because it's you who gives us insight and understanding and knowledge and wisdom. So we pray with all our getting, we would get understanding. So help us, Holy Spirit, to understand. You see, on the day of the rapture, when we are caught up to God and to his throne, the whole seven-sealed scroll is going to be open. Okay? And the first four trumpets are going to sound. And the seven thunders are going to speak. Okay? It's the day of perplexity. That's why one-fourth of all the world is destroyed. Okay, whole seven sealed scroll open, first four trumpets blown, seven thunders speak, and the seven thunders is God's voice. So, when we get to heaven and we see the whole thing happening, when God opens up the seven sealed scroll, when he takes it out of the Father's hand as we come before the throne, you see it in Daniel chapter 7, when... Uh, Jesus Christ comes with the clouds of heaven, okay? We come before the Ancient of Days, okay? That's when he takes the seven seal scroll out of the Father's hands and he opens it up. And so when he opens it up, the Bible says there's silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. That's the first half of the tribulation, okay? That's the first half of the tribulation. Why? Because it says in Zephaniah chapter 1, be silent, in the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. Shh. Be quiet. Come on now. Get the imagery. <laughs> it's like when, you know, um, like the president of the United States walks into a, a place. Okay. Okay. All the, you know, when like a, a, somebody famous or somebody important walks into a place, everybody, be, everybody, shh, everybody, shh. It's, it's somebody important. Shh, be quiet. Okay. There's no one making any noise when somebody comes into, uh, you know, a place that's important. Okay. Everybody, shh, be quiet. Okay. Now, how much more for the creator? Okay. For the creator who has just now entered human history like never before. Okay. He's just now entered human history like never before on the cloud and everything has shaken at his presence. The heavens shook, the earth shook. And so God says, silence now. <laughs> Shh, be quiet. Shh, 
Be silent. Shh. Shh. Be quiet. Shh. Be silent. Come on. Get in the text. <laughs> get in the text. When somebody important walks into some place, everybody, shh, be quiet. <laughs> How much more on this day? <laughs> How much more on this day? God says on that day, when the seven sealed scroll is open, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Remember from God's perspective, the whole time of the seven year tribulation is like an hour to him. It's only in like an hour to him because remember, we're in his domain now. We're in his domain where we're outside of time. We're in heaven where there is no time. Okay, but for in order for us to understand from God's perspective, because we're there now, it's like only been a half an hour, but really it's been three and a half years. The first half of the tribulation, because what's happening on the earth? Okay, don't even say his name. Shh, be quiet, don't say his name. What's happening on the earth? Time of wrath, time of darkness, first woe. Okay. First woe, dragon has come down to you with great wrath. Don't even say his name. Okay. Don't even say his name. Time of darkness. Okay. Night comes when no one can work. Time of darkness. Don't even say his name. Don't say it. Fifth seal. Martyrs. Don't say his name. Dragon. Okay. And what happens? This is God's judgment. Remember? This is God's judgment. Okay. This is God's judgment because he cried out to them during our time. Right now. 2022. August 13th. For the last 2,000 years, he's been crying. He's been crying out day and night through us, his servants, to come to Jesus, to believe the gospel. Okay, but they would not have Jesus to reign over them. They wanted the praise of men more than the praise of God. So the first half of the tribulation, God says, silence, he will not hear. I'm not going to hear you. Okay. He's not going to hear. Okay. Because all day long, all night long, he cried out to you if you get left behind and you would not hear him. So for the first three and a half years, he will not hear. You got to lay down your life. <laughs> you talking about you want to prove yourself. Okay. Lay down your life. Fifth seal. Matas. But he, he ain't going to hear your cry. Okay. He ain't going to hear your cry. Okay. And so the only two people that could speak during that time of the first half of the tribulation is the two witnesses. That's why when their ministry is up, the whole world hates them. OK, because the Bible says that it was through the two witnesses that the people of the earth were tormented. OK, because they were invincible. They're invincible. No one can harm them. No one could hurt them. OK, they are God's mouthpiece during the first half of the. Uh, tribulation for the first three and a half years. They're going to prophesy for 1,260 days. Okay? And maybe if, if I get through this, I want to show you something about these two witnesses as well. Uh, but let's keep on going. So, Revelation chapter 8, verse 2 says this, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, so these seven angels, okay, they come out uh, with God, hallelujah, with Jesus on the cloudy and dark day, okay? These seven angels come out with God on the cloudy and dark day. That's why he appears with them in Revelation chapter 1. There are seven stars in his hand, okay? The seven stars, which are the seven angels of the seven churches, these are the seven angels who stand before God. They have the seven trumpets, and they also have the seven bowls of wrath, okay? Now look what happens, verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar. Whoops. I'm sorry. We go back to Revelation uh, chapter 8. Sorry about that. Revelation chapter 8. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Okay. So remember this scene right here, you got to make a separation between Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 and Revelation chapter 8 verse 2. Okay. 
you got to make a distinction between this part right here because Revelation chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 2 through 5 is actually happening at the time when we all go into the Father's house and we see him opening up the seven sealed scroll. Okay, because this is where you see the coal of fire. Okay, this is what I want to get to in Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, because now look at this. Okay, this angel who goes before uh, the golden censer with much incense that he should offer with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar before the throne. The Bible says in verse 4 that the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. In verse 5, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Okay, so every time you see the voices, the thunderings, the lightnings, and the earthquake, and the fire, okay, that's when the temple in heaven is open. Okay, that's when the temple in heaven is open. So this is all happening at the time of the rapture. Okay, uh, Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 through 5 is all happening at the time of the rapture because the fire that this angel takes from the altar is the hailstones. Okay. The fire from the altar is the hailstones. And we know that there's a separation between those of us who love the praise of God and those of us, or well, those of those other people who love the praise of men. Okay. <laughs> All the goats. We, the sheep, we love the praise of God. And so there's a separation, and that separation has to do with the coals of fire as well. Okay, because the coals of fire that we see in Isaiah chapter 6, which is another picture of the rapture, it doesn't affect us as a judgment, but it actually purifies Isaiah. We see this in Isaiah chapter 6, and I pray that he would bring this out. Hallelujah. I pray that King Jesus would bring this out. Isaiah chapter 6 says this. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, so this is all about the rapture again. This is the same scene that we're reading about in Revelation chapter 8, only told in the Old Testament. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Okay, so now let's go back to Revelation chapter 8. Isaiah is already in the temple before the house fills with smoke. And so we're already inside, okay, we're already inside with the clouds of heaven inside the Father's house because we came like lightning when Jesus came to pick us up from uh, when he came like lightning from east to west in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, so we're already before the throne. And so when this scene is playing out, okay, look at where the smoke appears. Okay, the smoke appears. Okay, the smoke appears when the prayers are offered up, right? And so when this smoke appears, verse 4, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Okay, so the smoke has already filled the temple. So we have to be in there by this point. Just like Isaiah was already in the temple when he heard the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. Okay, and the doors were shaken. Okay, and the house was filled with smoke, but he didn't shake. Okay, everything else was shaken, but because he was planted on the rock, just like we're planted on the rock, we don't shake. Okay, but the heavens shake. Okay, the Bible says, and the posts of the door were shaken. Okay, everything shakes except for those who are planted, planted on the rock. And so here we see the house filled with smoke, but Isaiah's already inside seeing God in all of his glory. Okay, Just like here in Revelation 8, when the smoke starts to ascend out of the angel's hands, we're already inside the temple. Okay. Okay, remember this is all supernatural as well. This is all supernatural happening in the twinkling in the moment of time. And we're going to see it all play out from God's perspective, okay, the eternal perspective, okay, where time doesn't even, uh, doesn't even work like it does down here. Hallelujah. And so what happens? The same uh, order happens. In Isaiah chapter 6, after the temple is filled with smoke, what happens? Then the coal appears. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Here goes the key. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand 
having in his hand a live coal. Okay, that same coal that the angel, after the smoke fills the temple, in verse 5, this angel takes the censer and he fills with fire of the altar. That's the coal. And instead of uh, giving it to uh, cleanse the lips of Isaiah, as we see in Isaiah chapter 6, he takes the coals in the Revelation chapter 8, and he takes the coals and he casts it to the earth. Okay, those are the hailstones and coals of fire that weigh 100 pounds each. That's for everybody under God's feet, uh, you know, in that burning pot under the feet. Okay, under the feet. His feet are like burnished brass that burn in the furnace. Under that pot, okay, there's coals of fire. Okay, everybody in darkness, they're getting these coals of fire, this judgment. You see, but not us. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken uh, with the tongs from from the altar and he touched my mouth with it and said behold this has touched your lips your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged okay you see the contrast for those of us who love God for those of us who love the praise of God okay holy 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 is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory but those of us who are, are going to be in the tabernacle of the most high the coals of fire have no effect on us as far as judgment. Okay. Okay, the coals of fire come upon everybody left behind that love the praise of men. That's the point. That's the point that God is showing. Now, now I just want to take a little sidebar because I want to show you this as we stay on Isaiah chapter 6 because I want to show this about the two witnesses. Okay, now. <clears throat> the two witnesses... Okay, there's many theories about who they are, but I believe, like as we're going to see here, that this is how they're called. Okay, this is how they're called. The two witnesses, they have a specific ministry for 1,260 days, according to Revelation chapter 11. They have a specific ministry for 1,260 days, so that means that their ministry is going to coincide on the very day when the Antichrist confirms the covenant of death with many. Okay, because it's when the Antichrist comes to an agreement with the many nations that have been left behind, specifically Israel, that covenant of death, that from that moment that he signs that document of agreement with all those that have been left behind, specifically Israel, it's at that very day that the countdown begins. And so it's going to be a little bit of gap between the cloudy and dark day and the day when the Antichrist confirms the covenant with many. And that's what we see right here because the two witnesses are called. Okay, the two witnesses are called because look what happens. Because this is Isaiah chapter 6. This is after the rapture. Okay, Isaiah is in the temple. Okay, he represents, you know, the body of Christ, that man child caught up. Okay, on the cloudy and dark day who escape the hailstones and coals of fire. Okay. He's safe inside the Father's house. But guess what? God asked the question to everybody, okay, at the sacrifice when the fatted calf is killed. This is the question, verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? See? So now imagine yourself in the Father's house at the rapture with all the saints. The body of Christ, the menorah, table of showbread, 144,000. There we, are, there, there we are in the Father's house. And this same scene plays out again, okay? After the rapture, okay? After the hailstones and coals of fire have been cast upon the earth, okay? After everything has shaken, okay? And uh, God now asks everybody in attendance, whom shall I send and who will go for us? He's, he's asking who wants to be one of the two witnesses. Who wants to be one of the two witnesses? Okay, and then Isaiah says, then I said, here I am, send me. So Isaiah says, Hanani, that's the Hebrew word, Hanani, here I am, send me. So Isaiah volunteers to be one of the two witnesses, verse 9. And then God gives him the charge of the two witnesses. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes 
lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Okay. So God gives the commission to Isaiah as one of the two witnesses that this is what he has to do. And then Isaiah asked, well, how long am I going to do it for? Verse 11. Then I said, Lord, how long? And then God says, until everything's destroyed. Okay, until the midpoint of the tribulation when everything's destroyed. And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men far away and forsaken places, many in the midst of the land, but yet a tenth will be in it. Okay, that's the remnant. Okay, that's the remnant that escapes to the wilderness, verse 13. But yet a tenth will be in it, a tithe, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Okay? So this is a call that happens in heaven after the rapture for who wants to go back. Okay? Okay? God asks, you know, God asks after the rapture, okay, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then Isaiah volunteers. He says, here I am, send me. And then God gives Isaiah, as one of the two witnesses, the charge of what he has to do. Okay, he's going to speak, but people aren't still going to understand him. Okay, because God is going to make their ears and eyes heavy. Okay, he's going to shut their eyes and make their ears heavy. Okay, lest they should repent and be healed. And then Isaiah says, how long am I supposed to do this? And then God says, until everything is destroyed. <laughs> until everything is destroyed and only a tenth is left. Okay, a tithe. Okay, the tithe belongs to God. That's the uh, the people who make it to the wilderness at the midpoint. And so we see this same thing in Revelation chapter 10 with John. Okay, with, with John. John it also represents one of the two witnesses, the other two witnesses. Okay, that's why there's many theories about who the two witnesses are. Some say it's Enoch and Elijah, Enoch and Moses. Okay, Elijah and Moses. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, there's many theories, okay? But look at this, okay? We just went over Isaiah and how he represents one of them, but we see the same thing happening with John, okay? Because after the rapture, okay, because remember Revelation chapter 10, the rapture happens when Michael stands up with the little book open in his hand, okay? And he cries with the, with the voice of a lion, so that's the rapture because he's clothed with the cloud and the rainbow is upon his head. So the rapture has already happened. Okay, and then Michael says that there's no more time. There's time no longer. Okay, verse six, and he swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which there are therein that there should be time no longer. Okay, because the time of trouble has began. Okay, it's the time of wrath now. The first woe has now come. The dragon has been kicked out. Okay, the dragon has been kicked out and God says, woe. Okay. So the rapture has happened. Now look what happens with John. Okay. Okay. Look what happens with John after the rapture. Put your mind there. This is after the rapture. Verse eight. And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again. Okay. After the rapture, <laughs> what happens? The same thing that happened with Isaiah. Okay. Verse eight, Revelation chapter 10. And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke unto me again and said, go. And take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. Okay. So what happens? John goes back to the earth. Okay. He goes back to the to to the earth where Michael is standing upon uh, uh, the sand and the earth. He's standing upon the sea and the earth. Okay. And he takes that little book that's open in his hand, which is representation of the Bible, the word of God, verse nine. And he went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up and it shall make your belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Okay, and what happens? Verse 11, here's the charge. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Hallelujah. I pray that you got it. 
So it's the same thing happening with Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 at the time of the rapture. Raptures occurred. Smoke fills the temple. Okay. Isaiah is cleansed. Okay. And then God asked a question. He asked a question. <laughs> who wants to go back? Okay. Who wants to go back? Who wants to go? Okay. God asked, who wants to go? Everybody out in attendance at the, at the wedding. Okay. He asked everybody in the, in the house, who wants to go back? <laughs> The question's right here, verse 8. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? He asked the question. Okay, who wants to go? Who wants to go back? <laughs> who wants to go back now? <laughs> and then Isaiah said, here I am I. Send me. Hallelujah. Isaiah, my goodness. He says, here am I. Hanani, send me. Mm. Okay. And then God gives him the charge of what he has to do but the people still won't believe. And then Isaiah says, well, how long am I supposed to do this? And then God says, until everything is destroyed. <laughs> Read it, it's right here. Until everything is destroyed. And only a tenth remains, only the tithe, that which belongs to God remains, the remnant. Okay, so the same thing happens in Revelation chapter 10. God tells uh, John to go. <laughs> okay, go back to this earth. Okay, go back to the earth. <laughs> Okay, and take that little book out of the angel's hand, okay, Michael, the archangel, and eat it up, representing, okay, that book of remembrance, representing, uh, most importantly, uh, the Bible, because God says he gives power unto his two witnesses. Okay, he puts his spirit upon the two witnesses, and they're invincible. He gives power unto his two witnesses. And then he tells John that he has to prophesy again after he's eaten the book, that sweetest honey in his mouth, but it's bitter in his belly. Okay, because it's a, it's a tough job, the two witnesses. <laughs> and God says to John that he has to prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, the ten kings. Okay, so here goes John as another representation of the two witnesses being sent after the rapture. That's the point. After the rapture has occurred, the two witnesses are going to be sent. Okay. And we saw both perspectives in Isaiah chapter 6 and here in Revelation chapter 10 of God sending Isaiah, who volunteered, and John, who we told go. <laughs> okay. So the two witnesses could be anybody because there's many other examples of who they could be. Okay. Eldad and Medad. And I'm going to do a teaching about them again here pretty soon, Lord willing. And of course, the popular theories of Enoch and Elijah, Elijah and Moses, Moses and Enoch. You know, okay, those, uh, those popular opinions. But needless to say, my point is that I believe that this is going to play out how we just read it. Okay, we're all going to get caught up. Everybody who's, who's with God, who, who wants his praise, and he's going to do this, just like he did with Isaiah. Okay, who wants to go back now? <laughs> he's going to cry out, hallelujah. He said, who wants to go back now? <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just uh, you know... <sighs> crazy enough, but I don't think I'm crazy, to believe that this is going to happen just like we read it. Okay? Again, because God don't change. Just like we read it right here in Isaiah chapter 6. After the rapture, God says, who wants to go back? Okay. Who wants to go back? Here it goes. <laughs> Verse 8, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Who wants to go back? Who wants to go down to the house of the dragon? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. <laughs> okay. And then again, Revelation chapter 10, after the rapture, we see John taking the little book that's open in the angel's hand, which is Michael, and eating it up. And then God says, go. Okay. Because you have to prophesy again before many peoples and tongues and nations and kings. There goes the second witness. Two witnesses, Isaiah and John. OK, <laughs> is it really Isaiah and John? I don't know. I don't know who they are. They're nameless. OK, but God has shown us, you know, uh, many examples of the two witnesses throughout the Bible. Hallelujah. And if it happens just like this, like I believe it's going to happen, like Isaiah chapter six and like Revelation chapter 10, God, he's going to ask who wants to go back. Verse eight, who wants to go back? 
Who wants to go back? Okay. I think it's going to play out just like that. Hallelujah. And I'm using my sanctified imagination. But that was just a sidebar. And I pray that that was a blessing to you, whoever you are out there that's listening and uh, receiving what thus saith the Lord according to the scriptures. Amen. And so back to these woes. Okay, back to these woes. Okay, so there's four woes. And we've only talked about the first woe. Okay, the first woe is the dragon being cast down. Okay, and so now we're going to get these other three woes. Verse 6, and it's connected to uh, the seven trumpets. Okay, verse 6, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire, mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Okay, so there goes the hailstones and coals of fire. Okay, the same hailstones and coals of fire that the angel took uh, from uh, the, the altar in heaven and filled the censer with, with, with that fire and cast it into the earth. Okay, so the first trumpet is the 100-pound hailstones. Okay, the first trumpet is the 100-pound hailstones. Okay, it's the cloudy and dark day. God has a sacrifice and God, he's passing through the parts. Genesis chapter 15, there's hailstones and coals of fire under the smoking oven. Okay. First trumpet. Verse 8. The second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. Okay, that mountain, that great mountain is Babylon the Great, totally destroyed. Okay. That Babylonian kingdom. Okay, the leopard kingdom. Okay, the leopard kingdom is totally destroyed, burnt with fire. Okay, a mountain is a kingdom. Okay. It's a great mountain, according to God. This great mountain, Babylon the Great, is burning with fire. Okay, totally destroyed. Okay, from coast to coast, up and down, left and right, totally destroyed. A burnt mountain, the same thing that you read about in Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51. Babylon becomes a burnt mountain. Okay, and now we see it in Revelation. That great mountain is burning with fire. Okay, Babylon the Great judged. Hallelujah. Babylon the Great judged. This is, this is the second trumpet. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Okay. Verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven. Okay, so here comes the dragon. <laughs> here comes the dragon. He's that great star. Okay, the same great star that had fallen that is given the key to the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9, okay? When the fifth angel sounds, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to the earth, okay? That star that had fell from heaven to the earth is this one right here, okay? This great star, okay? Burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, okay? Just like the church has many names, just like God has many titles and names, Okay, so too does the dragon have many titles and names. Okay, people don't even, can't even agree if his name used to be Lucifer. Okay, but needless to say, there's a, a bunch of titles in the book of Revelation for him. The great red dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Okay, but here's another one of his names. Wormwood. Okay, Beelzebub is another name. There's plenty of names for this character. Okay, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, but one of these names is Wormwood. Okay, this is the dragon. He's this great star that's being that has been kicked out of heaven. He's coming down. Whoa. Okay, remember that's the first woe. The first woe is him. Okay. Because there's four woes. Remember, Revelation chapter 12, this is the first woe. When the dragon gets kicked out, therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Okay. He's the first woe. And so here he goes. The first woe. Wormwood. Okay, He's the first woe. <laughs> and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Okay. That's that great red dragon coming down. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded. And the third part of the sun was smitten. And the third part of the moon. And the third part of the stars. Okay. So there goes the third of the stars that are in Wormwood's tail, also coming down. And the whole 
planet is darkened on this day because it's a day of darkness that God promised us that we won't be a part of if we believe in him. So everything is darkened when the fourth trumpet sounds. Okay, And the third of the angels are with the dragon now on the earth. So as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise, okay? Darkness everywhere, okay? The first woe has come. Wormwood is now on the planet, okay? That great dragon called uh, the devil and Satan, okay? He's on the earth now. First woe. Now look at this, verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe! Woe! Woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there's three more woes to come. And these three woes, the angel identifies it as the final three trumpets. Okay. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. So it's the fifth trumpet. That's one woe. The sixth trumpet, the second woe. And the seventh trumpet, the third woe. Those are the three woes that are still to come. Okay, but remember, there's four total. Because the first one was Wormwood coming down. Okay, when the devil gets kicked out, he's the first woe. <laughs> Okay, when the door to heaven is open, he gets kicked down and to the earth and there's time no more. Okay, seven year tribulation begins. But then, okay, uh, once uh, the apocalypse begins and the seven sealed scroll is open and the first four trumpets blow, well, then there's a pause. Okay, and then uh, there's uh, three more trumpets to go and those three trumpets are woe trumpets, the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet. And so we see that the fifth trumpet is in regards to the opening of the bottomless pit. Okay, and I believe this is uh, an event that's tied to the midpoint of the tribulation. Okay, when God speaks again. Okay, because remember the first half of the tribulation, he's silent. Okay, the first half of the tribulation, he's silent. Okay. After he, after he comes to get us, and he causes his glorious voice to be heard, he goes back to the to, to his house. Okay, like a lion goes back to its den. <laughs> okay, there's images in the Old Testament about that event. He goes back to his den. Okay, uh, uh, to lay down and to observe. Okay, but he's quiet. Okay, and he's observing. Okay, he's observing what, what the people are going to do. Okay, he's caused his glorious voice to be heard. And everybody shook that was left behind. But then he goes back and he's quiet. Okay, quiet for the uh, first half of the tribulation. Okay, because he's already spoken. Seven seals scroll open, first four trumpets blown, and the seven thunders have spoken. Okay, and everything has, sh has shaked at that point in time. And then the Antichrist takes over. And so he sends the two witnesses at the point when the Antichrist signs that covenant to be his spokespiece, uh, okay, for the first three and a half years. And then at the midpoint, okay, when the abomination of desolation happens, that's when God is going to speak again, okay? And that's when the three woes are going to come, the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, the seventh trumpet, when God speaks again, okay, at the midpoint. And so we see the fifth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9, when, this, uh, when it happens, uh, verse 12 tells us, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Hallelujah. So the fifth trumpet is the first woe, okay, the opening of the bottomless pit. And then, as we see, one woe is past, the fifth trumpet is now past. Uh, John says, behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Okay, so we get the next one right here, the sixth trumpet. Okay, because the sixth trumpet is the second woe. As we learn from Revelation chapter 8, that these three woes are connected with the voices of the three angels that have yet to sound. Okay, the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet. So the sixth trumpet is uh, the second woe. And this is when... Uh, this great war happens, okay, this great war happens where there's um, <laughs> uh, the four angels are loose that are bound at the great river Euphrates, okay, and then there's a 200 million man army, okay, 
and they're going to kill one third of all the men who are alive at this moment in time. Okay, a great war is going to break out that kills one third of the people that are alive at this time. Okay, and that's the second woe, the sixth trumpet. And so, in the thematic um, theme, as the book of Revelation is going to a chronological conclusion, but you can't read it in a chronological order, God has, you know, put things in his word in order to, uh, you know, <laughs> hide his wisdom from those who think that they are wise. And so in Revelation chapter 11, it's not until we get to verse 14 where it says that the second woe is past and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Okay. So God waited until Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, to talk about the second woe being passed. Why? Because chronologically, as we read the book of Revelation, the second woe has passed. Okay, because the second woe is what? Was back here in the ninth chapter with the sixth trumpet. So the second woe has passed, according to reading the book of Revelation chronologically. <laughs> okay, because it was in Revelation chapter 9. Okay, where we saw the sixth trumpet. And by the time we get to Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, God says, he, he puts it in here on purpose. He said, the second woe is past. Okay. And it has passed because it's, it's back a couple chapters. And then he says, what? And behold, the third woe comes quickly. And so what's the next verse? Well, the seventh angel sounds. So that's the next woe that comes quickly because it's the seventh angel, which is the third woe that sounds with his trumpet. Okay, so I pray that you got that. I pray that you got the four woes. And I pray that, uh, you know, you were edified with this teaching. And I pray that God spoke to your heart and that you were blessed on this Sabbath uh, with the word of God. Because uh, he's amazing and he's more than amazing. He's awesome and he's more than awesome. He is excellent and he's more than excellent. He is the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Great is his faithfulness. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Glory to his name. Go in peace, children of God. And let me just read a blessing upon you. Hallelujah, because we're a kingdom of priests, right? We're a kingdom of priests, so I want to read uh, our priestly blessing according to Numbers chapter 6, the ironic blessing. And this is what the ironic blessing says. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Hallelujah. His name is upon you, child of God, because you love his praise more than the praise of men. And therefore, on the cloudy and dark day, on the day of separation, when the smoking oven passes through the parts, you're going to be the burning torch because you got oil in your lamp. You got oil in your jaw. And when we go into the Father's house, I pray that when we pass through that fire, as the silver is refined and as the gold is purified, that we would have something that remains forever and ever where moth and can't corrupt and a thief cannot come through and steal. And I pray that as we rejoice in the father's house, <laughs> I pray that one of us would be willing to go back. If it plays out just like Isaiah chapter six declares it, who's going to go back. I pray one of us would say, Hineni, here I am, send me. May it happen according to your word. In the name of all names, I pray and ask it all, Jesus the Messiah. Amen.